this is going to be a talk that's going to talk about Wi-Fi, something we're all kind of familiar with. But it's actually going to delve hopefully a bit deeper than just the ins and outs of how it works. It's going to talk about the politics of Wi-Fi and the history of it and how it may have lessons and how we manage all kinds of resources in the future and problems that we have. But to kind of wind back, in 2015, I was doing my PhD, ill-fated PhD, here at Southampton. Um, and I was also doing work for Microsoft in sub-Saharan Africa, looking at the social and economic impact of affordable internet access in rural Africa. You know, how does it affect lives? How does it change what people can do? When I was contacted by a friend who said, Rich, you're working with Wi-Fi in Africa, and my friends Nils and Jazz, who've just set up a charity working in the Kale jungle, need Wi-Fi in the Kale jungle. Can you help them? And I thought, well, I'd love to be able to help them. And so in late 2015, we went to the Kale jungle and we put the first Wi-Fi network into the Kale jungle. We were uh, connecting 5,000 people every week. And the impact that it had on people um, um, was, was incredible, actually. So after people's needs for food and water and shelter were met, communication was the first thing that people asked for. I mean, to be able to talk to loved ones, to be able to keep the connections going that kind of marked people's everyday lives, which when people are displaced, are some of the first things that collapse. And so uh, with, my, with another person, Samson Rinaldi, who joined us, we've started an organization called Jangala, which is going to focus on connecting, uh, creating Wi-Fi systems for people who are displaced around the world. And we have like seven prototypes out there in various places in Europe, and we're sending stuff out to um, Kenya in the next few weeks, and we want to get 100 systems out there this year, just for people who you know, are talked about but often have no ability to talk back. And interestingly, the technology we used to make the network happen in the jungle was Wi-Fi. And like, Wi-Fi is a remarkable technology. It's magic when it works. It's hell when it doesn't. But the history behind it is a fascinating one. <clears throat> so wireless communication is indispensable now. We use it to watch television, we use it to monitor how children are sleeping, we use it to talk to distant space probes, and we use it to connect to the internet. And actually, for people who are kind of, you know, teenagers and younger now, the idea of kind of internet being connected to through wires will become increasingly strange. Um, we expect it to be wireless. <clears throat> and to make wireless communication possible, you need radio waves. You need to transmit and you need to receive radio waves. And so people have been messing around with radio waves now for about 100 years, more so. And at the beginning, it was a very kind of amateur pursuit. <clears throat> Heinrich Hertz, who was the first person to send a signal from one place to another at the speed of light using radio waves, thought, oh, isn't that interesting? And then promptly went on to something else. <laughs> Lord Kelvin, when he heard that you could send messages like this, said, Who'd want to do that? I'd much rather use a boy and a pony. <laughs> but, but then suddenly the right person finds the idea. And um, the right person in this case was Mr. Marconi. And for him, this idea meant lots and lots and lots and lots of lots of money and lots of power and more money as well. And the thing that you see on screen behind me um, a one-time visitor to Southampton, the Titanic, and Mr. Marconi play an important role in how the use of the electromagnetic spectrum evolved. So after the sinking of the Titanic, um, Mr. Marconi and his company may have been in a lot of trouble. He had a rule that the people on the Titanic who operated the radios were his employees, and they weren't allowed to talk to any other radio operator who wasn't a Marconi operator. So there were messages coming in on the Titanic saying, iceberg, not quite dead ahead just yet, but coming close. And the operators didn't pass on the messages. They weren't allowed to. And so to avoid the storm that was heading in his direction, he and a number of other big commercial interests decided to put the blame, or place part of the blame, on amateur radio operators, saying that these people caused interference. People couldn't receive the signal. And the sinking of the Titanic marked a moment when access to the radio spectrum started to become more and more restricted. Governments around the world made it illegal for people to broadcast 
any radio signals, unless you had a license from the government. And these licenses were like, were licenses were like exclusive property rights. If you had a license, you could transmit. If you didn't, you could not. <clears throat> and this became the way that we've done things. First of all, you could get a license using a beauty contest. You had to go and go through a bureaucratic procedure about what you were going to do with the spectrum and, and, what, you're going, and, and what, you, what you're going to use it for, television, radio, whatever. And more recently, they've been auctioned. And these auctions fetch billions and billions of pounds or dollars. You know, spectrum is called the new black gold. And interestingly, this system of property rights, spectrum is property rights, was meant to create amazing amounts of innovation and new uses, but it really hasn't. What's happened is that the people who already have lots of spectrum have acquired more, and they sit on it and quite often aren't even using it. And so why was this system designed? And it comes back down to something which is drilled into all economists from birth, which is that one of the most fundamental forces that we face is the tragedy of the commons. And so the tragedy of the commons is essentially the idea that if everyone can access a resource, then that resource will be overused. So in the case of a finite resource, like fish stocks or forests or, um, you know, uh, or shared milk in a fridge, <laughs> what, what will happen is that people will take far more than the sustainable share and those resource systems may completely collapse. Um, and we've seen examples of that around the world. I mean, Easter Island is one example. And for resources that are finite but renewable, so ones that don't completely disappear, like road systems or the electromagnetic spectrum, they become congested. So that what happens is that this thing that could be useful ends up being so clogged up that you can't make any valuable use of it at all. And one way out of the tragedy of the commons is to assign property rights. You give some people control of the system and they can buy and sell it, they can exclude others, and hopefully that should lead to the people that value the resource the most ending up with ownership of that resource. <clears throat> and this was the theory that underlay this experiment in Spectrum of creating property rights. But that one didn't work. But one thing that did work in the radio spectrum was something by accident, and that is something called the license exempt spectrum or the Spectrum Commons. So, serendipitously, there happen to be a few tiny slivers of the radio spectrum, you know, a few frequencies dotted about from, you know, a few, mega, from a few kilohertz all the way up to 100 gigahertz, which is where we communicate, which are open for anyone to use. And it happened by accident. So there used to be these bands called the Industrial Scientific and Medical Bands, which were full of microwave ovens and industrial heaters and machinery, and they were thought to be so polluted and so junk that no one wanted to use them for communication. And people couldn't even, weren't allowed to use them for communication. But in 1985, the US Federal Communications Commission took a decision which was to say, OK, let's actually allow anyone who wants to use these bands to communicate the right to communicate. They can't exclude others, and they have to keep their power down, but they can use it as they like. <clears throat> and so, because no one owned this, people didn't really know what to make of it. So progress was slow. People kind of dipped their toe into the spectrum and, and, and you know, progress was really slow. But then, in the year 2000, Steve Jobs stood on a stage, which was probably just like this, <laughs> took a MacBook Pro and a hula hoop, and whilst browsing the internet, moved a hula hoop around this computer and said, look, no wires. Um, and that was Wi-Fi. And Wi-Fi is an open standard that's developed in a very kind of democratic, argumentative way by lots of people, including big companies and professors at universities and individuals with too much brain power and time on their hands. <laughs> um, and it's not just Wi-Fi that lives in the spectrum. Bluetooth, lots of other protocols that you may or may not have heard of, like Zigbee and Wireless Heart and stuff. And what's happened with um, the license M spectrum has been remarkable. So, right now, more devices and items are sold that use these shared, uncontrolled, messy bands than use the pristine manicured lawns of the license spectrum. And it's just, you know, projected to get, the disparity is going to even grow over time. So this is a huge success story. There are lots of different things out there. Things are normally very cheap. 
You don't have to ask anyone's permission before you use it or put it into a device that you want to make and you want to sell. <clears throat> but that raises the question. So, how did this happen? I mean, according to economists, this was not supposed to work. This was open access stuff. This should have become, you know, as clogged as, you know, the, the road leading to, like, the bridges across the river in Southampton. But that didn't happen. <laughs> um, and it took a lot of people a long time to piece together what might be happening here. And funnily enough, almost none of them were economists. So <laughs> the first person who gets an honourable mention is Eleanor Ostrom. So she's the first woman and the first non-economist to win the Nobel Peace Prize. She was a sociologist. So her work was she went round the world and she looked at resource systems that people were sharing. And she found, she never found the tragedy of the common. And she never found systems of either central control or, or private ownership. In the main, she found systems of rules that were developed by and evolved by the people participating in a resource system. From irrigation systems in the Indonesian highlands to lobster fisheries off the Boston coast. The way in which people manage resources was often chaotic and argumentative, but there were deep rules that developed, and kids were even educated up into those rules. So Ostrom's work was incredibly important in trying to understand how could things work without centralised control or a system of property rights. Carol Rose uh, is a law professor who coined the term the comedy of the commons. And her insight was that actually, there may be some systems in which if you have more and more participants, they create more and more mess, negative externalities that bring the whole system down. But what if there are some systems in which people create the opposite of that? So the more and more people participate, they create benefits that they themselves don't capture, but are felt by everyone else around them. And she mentioned things like education or language. The more people that speak a language, again, the richer that language is. She talked about commerce and trade, um, access to coastlines, lots of other examples where participation led to benefits rather than costs for other people. <clears throat> and a couple of years ago, uh, Brett Frischman, who's a professor of law and um, economics who's quoted there, turned all of this together into a theory of infrastructure resources and said, what if there are these things which um, can be shared to a certain extent that are inputs into lots of different things. And those different things that are the outputs downstream of these inputs have all kinds of uses. Some commercial, some non-commercial, some partly commercial, some creating public goods like knowledge or music or um, anything that can be kind of infinitely shared, inf information, and so on. <clears throat> and his great insight was to say, in those cases, managing something in a way as to maximise usage is the way to get the most out of a particular resource. You know, don't control it central, in a central way. Don't leave it just to markets, but create sustainable sets of rules that can ma maximise the benefit that a particular resource can create. <clears throat> and so I think that gets us to a kind of interesting point, which is we face so many issues today which <clears throat> seem intractable in some ways. And often there are economists pushing the idea that we must create more and more property rights around everything, that things must be assigned and privatised. But actually there are lots of cases in which this kind of approach could be incredibly fruitful. So the picture there of connecting the unconnected, so that's in Detroit, which has been abandoned by both private companies and the government of the city. And people are taking things into their own hands. They're building wireless networks to give you know, their families and their kids decent internet access. With how we manage the environment, again, that's a place in which markets and carbon markets and lots of things have, have not fulfilled their promises. <clears throat> Intellectual property and copyright is now becoming a barrier to creativity and innovation as much as it's supposed to be um, facilitating it. <clears throat> and even in cases like housing, where should we consider the housing stock of a city to be a purely private good that doesn't affect other people? Or is it something that has the properties of an infrastructure that we can manage in a way that's more fruitful? And so, uh, that's it for me.